Amen, amen. Well, hey, why don't you go ahead and have a seat, and uh, let me just uh, welcome you all again. Good to see you guys here this morning, on this beautiful, sunny May Sunday. Glad you're joining us here at Bell Road Church. My name's Tyrone, and I am uh, the pastor here. And if you're here as a first-time guest, man, thanks for coming. We're, we're super honored that you're here. I hope that, hope that you have a great experience. So we'd love to have you a part of our church. Love to have you a part of what God is doing here. In fact, you know, Amy mentioned it earlier, but if you want to come and check out our membership class, it's, we've got a membership lunch today. You can just check out a little bit more about what does it mean to commit to being a part of the family here. And, and feel free to come right after this service. We're going to have a uh, you know, free lunch, and, and we'll have that, that class going on for you. Well, hey, today we are finishing our series on the treasure principle. Today is the grand finale. This is it, the, the, the exciting ending to this series. And I love this series, actually. It's been really good for us because it's helping us to have an eternal perspective in life, which how many of you guys know that's a good thing? It's so important for us to have an eternal perspective in life because here's the deal. This life that we're living right now, it's going to end. And we don't like to think about that. We like to kind of push that thought off and not worry about that. But it's going to happen whether we like it or not, whether we're ready or not. It will end. And so we've got to be ready. We've got to think about it. And, and we want to make sure we're living life in light of eternity. And so this series is really helping us get, have an eternal perspective on our life, but also our finances. It's important for us to have an eternal perspective on how we handle the money that we have. And so we're going to spend one last Sunday, again, talking about being givers and talking about our finances. In fact, here's a, here's a motto I'd encourage you to live by. I heard a friend of mine say this years ago, and he says, this is like my life mantra. He's like, this is, actually, I think he said it was like my mission in life. Live to give. Simple little phrase, but man, I, wouldn't it be cool if you and I lived that way? Just live to give. That we would live life as givers, not takers. That would be people who are generous and not selfish. Live to give. That's a great, a great motto in life. Wouldn't you agree? Well, let's look at this parable that Jesus told in Matthew 13. It's essential to the treasure principle. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. So what's Jesus saying here? He's saying, it is worth it to give up everything and follow me. It's so worth it because what we let go of, what we give up, it just pales in comparison to what God is going to do in our life and what he gives us and how he leads us. So it's worth it to let go, to give up, to surrender, to, to sell out for the cause of following him and being a part of his kingdom. Because when you're part of his kingdom, it's way better than just being a part of the earthly kingdom. Amen. We're in this earthly kingdom, but we get to experience the blessings of this heavenly kingdom as we begin a relationship with Jesus, we're part of his kingdom. And so Jesus is saying, hey, go all in for my kingdom because it's worth it. It's so, it's so worth it to give everything up for Jesus. Galatians 2.20 talks about, I love, I love these words here, I've been crucified with Christ. These are powerful words. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And this life that I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2, 20. Great verse, words to live by right there. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I hope that that describes your life. That's the goal. That's what we're aiming for. See, Jesus is calling us to be sold out for him, to, be, uh, to live a life completely surrendered to him. We want to be wholehearted in, in our passion in following him, and we want to do that unashamedly. So we're not about following rules. That's not what this church is about. That's not what Christianity is all about. We're about following Jesus. That's what this is all about. So I want to encourage you to look to Jesus, follow him, and to look to his word. And allow his word to, to speak to you and to lead you. Think about this. As we talk about living with an eternal perspective, think about that moment when you step into eternity. In those first five moments, what do you think is going to cross your mind? What do you think is going to go through your mind? In that moment, we will realize how we should have lived our life. We will know fully how we should have lived, right? Because we'll have the benefit of being on the other side of eternity and looking back and we'll say, this is how I should have lived. But here, here's the good news. You don't have to wait till then to figure it out because you can look to God's word. See, God's word tells us how to live. 
This is his eternal word full of eternal truths, and this will help you for all of eternity right here. We've got to look to his word. And the good news is this, is that he empowers us with his spirit to live this thing out. So Jesus wants to empower you. He wants to strengthen you to live out his word. I, I want to encourage you to make sure that your word or your life is guided by his word. Don't let your life be guided by what American culture says, what they, how they say you need to live, how they say you should manage your, your finances, and all that kind of stuff. Let God's word be the, the guidebook for your life. Let this dictate how you think, how you act, and how you live. And here's the great news. You and I are blessed for it. Because God's got way better plans than we do. We feel like we do, don't we? We feel like we know better, but we really don't. And so we gotta under, we gotta we gotta trust the one who is infinite. We gotta trust the one who understands and knows all. And not just us. We're finite in our understanding and our thinking. So look to him, trust him, and make sure you live a life that's really centered around Jesus and his word. Because that's the goal. In fact, when you look at the, the stages of the Christian life, there's really four stages that you and I could live in. The first one would be exploring Christianity. That would be stage number one. If you're here this morning and you're exploring Christianity, let me just say we're super glad that you're here. And if you have any questions, you need any help with this, then let us know. Because sometimes I can talk about stuff and it doesn't make sense to somebody who's exploring Christianity. My goal is that it does make sense, but sometimes I don't make sense. Sometimes I don't make sense to anybody, and please forgive me for that. I'll do my best. But this is a good place to be, exploring Christianity. We've all been there, and maybe you're there right now. And we're super glad that you're here. Second stage would be, I'm growing in Christ. And then from there, I move into, I'm close to Christ. And then the fourth stage, and this is the goal, I live a Christ-centered life. That's the goal, that you and I would live in that place. Keep growing, get to this place where my life is centered fully and completely on Jesus. So in light of all of that, let me pray. And let's just pray that uh, God would illuminate his word and his message to us here this morning and uh, help us live for him, especially in regards to our finances and our money. So join me in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for today. and Thank you for bringing us all here together. Lord, I just know that people are going to be blessed and helped by this message. Lord, I know wholeheartedly you're going to bring freedom. You're, you're going to bring blessings. You're going to bring a new season into people's lives as they fully trust you and surrender to you in every area of their life, and especially in this area of money. So Lord, I pray that you, I ask that you'd give people the strength and the courage to fully trust you with their finances. In Jesus' name, I pray. And again, Lord, we're just, we pray for the sons. We're so thankful they got the number one pick in the NBA draft lottery. God, Lord, give them wisdom to pick the right person so they can dominate the NBA. Once again, amen. amen. I was thinking if anyone was with me. I prayed for them in my first service. I wanted to just cover it again in this service. Make sure we, they were the worst team in the NBA last year, so. I don't know if God cares or not, but it probably doesn't hurt to pray, right? Second Corinthians 8. Second Corinthians 8 is where we're going to start here this morning. That's what it says, verse 1, And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. So Paul here is writing to the church in Corinth, these Christians in Corinth. And he says, hey, I want to tell you a little story about those Christians and the churches in Macedonia. It says this in verse 2, Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. It's interesting. Look at that statement there. So these churches in Macedonia, they were going through severe trial. What it was, we don't know. We aren't told, but it was severe. It wasn't just trial. It was severe trial. You ever been there before? Yeah. There, and this is what it says. So in that, they still had overflowing joy and extreme poverty. But even though they had all of that, it resulted in rich generosity. That's pretty cool. He goes on to say, for I testify. He's like, I'm telling you, I saw this, that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. And that's the goal for you and I. Give as much as we're able and even beyond what we're able. Entirely on their own, they, ur they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since 
he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. Notice he mentions grace several times. He says this, but just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Everybody say grace of giving. That's a cool phrase right there. So if you're going to excel in something, that means you're excellent at it, right? So that means you're, you're really good at it. Okay? You're excelling above and beyond what is normal, average, or bad, obviously. And so Paul is recognizing, hey, you guys excel in quite a few things. You're excelling in knowledge. You're growing in knowledge. That's good. You're, you're excelling in faith, in your love for me, for, for people. Okay, you're excelling in that. Make sure that you don't neglect excelling in the grace of giving. You want to also make sure you're excelling there, that you're growing there, that you're getting better at the grace of giving. So what does that mean? Well, grace. Most of us understand this saving grace. It's the grace of God where we ask for forgiveness for our sins, and and His grace is always there for us. And I'm thankful for His amazing grace. Okay, so that's the saving grace that we receive from God. We can't earn it. It's not based upon anything you and I do. You can't earn a relationship with God. You and I cannot earn a ticket into heaven. It's only by His grace. And no matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, we can come to Him, ask for forgiveness, and His grace is always there. That's the saving grace. So Paul here is talking about not just saving grace, but he's talking about what we would say is an enabling grace. This is the grace of giving that God has given them. He's enabling them to give in greater ways. So there's this enabling grace or I would call it an empowering grace that God wants to have on your life as well. It's an empowering grace to help you live out his word. And so it was on the Macedonian churches. They had this empowering grace on them to give. And so I pray that that would come upon you as well. This enabling grace, this empowering grace to live how God wants you to live. And it would be this empowering grace to to give. So that's what it means to excel. And to excel also means that you and I would to excel in giving means that we would give the way that God wants us to give. Which leads us to the question, how does God want us to give? So before I answer that, let me just first lay a couple foundational things. We've got to understand this. And this goes back to week number one in the treasure principle. The big idea for this morning comes from week number one. It's God owns everything. I'm his money manager. He owns it all. I just manage it. It all belongs to him. Psalm 24 says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. That includes us, right? So I belong to the Lord and everything that I have belongs to God. Okay, so we've got to start there. We've got to understand that. So is this my money? God, you tell me how to handle my money? God's saying, no, here's the starting point. It's my money. You need to understand that. Okay, that's, given, that's helping us have this eternal perspective. And this is a tough place for many of us to get to. Man, I worked hard for this. I slaved away for this. I don't even like my job, but now I got the money, so at least I got the money, you know, and we think this is mine, and, and, and so God, what? What, you, you want to, like, isn't it enough for me to go to church? Now you want my money? Like, what is, and, and remember the call to follow Jesus is the call to surrender everything. And so God owns it all. It all belongs to him, my whole life, my whole heart. Everything is his. So that's the starting point for all this. But then, how do we give? How do we give to God? Most scholars would, and even most Christians would agree that the tithe is how God would want us to give. Now, there's some debate over this issue, even some tension in this issue, because in the New Testament, you won't find implicit instructions on you and I should tithe 10% of our income. So you won't see that implicitly, but you will see the principle reinforced, it's implicitly described in the Old Testament. We'll look at a couple, of this, uh, a couple of verses about it. But you'll see it reinforced and talked about in different ways. And so we're going to explore this. And I understand there is tension in this topic. But I want to I talk about the tithe and what this means and how this looks. And just giving and, and excelling in the grace of giving. Because I really want to help you. As your pastor, I want to preach the whole word. And I want you to live a free life. I want you to live a blessed life, and I want you to understand what it means to fully follow Jesus. And that includes this discussion as well. Well, the author of the Treasure Principle, 
Randy Alcorn, which by the way, again, let me just say, if you haven't got the book, get the book. It's good. This is the last week we're talking about Treasure Principle, and I'm, I'm highlighting a few things from the book, but there's so much more in the book that you will enjoy. You'll get a lot out of this book. So uh, if you haven't ordered it, get it and read it. You will learn a lot from it. it. It'll speak to you. But I love how Randy approached this topic even in the book. He says this about talking about tithing. He says, I have mixed feelings on this issue. I detest legalism, which I'd agree. Wouldn't you agree the same thing? We're not about being a legalistic here. That's not what this is all about, okay? Remember, we're, we're, we're not following rules. We're following Jesus. Okay, so he says, I detest legalism. I certainly don't want to try to pour new wine into old wineskins, imposing superseded first covenant restrictions on Christians, meaning Old Testament covenants. He, so, but then he goes on to say this, every New Testament example of giving goes far beyond the tithe. However, none falls short of it. So let's look at a few verses. Okay, Leviticus 27 says this, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. What is a tithe? A tithe literally means a tenth. It's ten percent. In the Old Testament, they were mandated to give the tithe. Bring ten percent. Bring that first tenth. That was part of the mandate. And they actually also had free will offerings. Above and beyond the tithe, they were able to give, and so they would do that. But God says this. He says this about the tithe. He says, it is holy to the Lord. And don't you think that as we give to God even today that he views that as holy? When you give, that is a holy act of worship. It may not feel like it when you're online giving and you're just like, see, you see, you know, that's why some people love to write out a check and bring it on Sunday mornings because it feels more of a worship thing for them. You know, some people don't like the thought of, I'm just going to automate my giving to God, you know, and so I don't even have to think about it because then is, am I, is that really done in worship? You know, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't really matter. You do how, whatever you want to do, wherever your conviction lies on all of that. But regardless of how you do it, I, I really believe God still views that as holy. It's holy to him. Then Proverbs 3 says this. He says, honor the Lord with your wealth. Obviously, you want to honor God with your whole life, right? That's the goal. If I live a Christ-centered life, then I'm really, holistically, I want to honor God. And so specifically in Proverbs 3, it says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. So first fruits is this Old Testament principle you'll see quite a few times throughout the Old Testament narrative. And it's a reference that God has given to his people to say, Give your first tenth. That's your first fruits. Now think about this in agrarian culture when they got this harvest coming and they're being asked by God, give that first 10% to me. And so they're having to trust God that he's going to continue to give them the harvest and they're going to get the crops and everything later on after they give to God that first portion. That takes a lot of trust, doesn't it? That can be a hard thing to do. And it's the same thing for us. Because what, what God was saying there is he's saying, hey, don't give me your last, give me your first. Am I first in your life or am I last in your life? And so when it comes to even paying our bills, who do we pay first? Who are we giving to first? And again, okay, it's, it's not mine, it's God's. And so I want to make sure that even my money lines up with my values and my convictions and my belief in Jesus. I want to give him my first my best, not my leftovers, not my, when I remember, not if, uh, if I even have anything left, but it's my, my first, okay? Lots of other scriptures we can look at the Old Testament. Let's jump to the New Testament. Jesus says this in Matthew 23. He says, what sorrow awaits you teachers of the religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites. <laughs> not making too many friends that day right there, those guys, right? You guys are hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, mercy and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. So here's these guys, these religious leaders, and they're fully living according to a lot of the law. And part of the law that they're really committing to is they're giving the, the, a tithe, they're, they're tithing. But they're struggling with actually loving people and showing that they care and, and exercising mercy and, and justice and all that. And so Jesus is saying, awesome, you're tithing, 
But can you actually show that you love people and that you care about God and you love God and, and, and exercise mercy and, and all these things? You want to make sure you're growing and focusing on justice, mercy, and faithfulness. But also, he says, keep tithing. That's an okay thing to do. And so Jesus right there acknowledges the principle of the tithe. He's saying, hey, that's good. Keep tithing. Just make sure you're, 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 you're doing well in these other areas because this really matters and how you treat people and how you look at me. So Jesus acknowledges this, and, and even in those days, the, the tithe would have been like the base minimum. That's the starting point. Now, when you look at Jesus and his teachings, he said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. In fact, Jesus even said, when he, he referred back to many laws, and, and what he did is he raised the bar on all the laws. You think about that. In the Old Testament, it says, do not murder. But Jesus says, you've heard that it says, do not murder. He says, but if you have hate in your heart, then you have al you're already committing murder in your heart on the inside. So he's raising the bar. In the Old Testament, it says, do not commit adultery. Jesus says, hey, you've heard that, but here's what I want you to know. When you look at someone lustfully in your heart, you've already committed adultery right there. He raises the bar. In the Old Testament, talks about tithe. Jesus comes along and says, hey, I'm actually out calling you to surrender your whole life to me. Give everything, let go of it all, and, and follow me. So Jesus really raises the bar in everything. So I want to look at for a few moments these levels of giving. This kind of helps us to see where we're at in our generosity. How am I doing in this grace of giving in my life? And my goal is, is not to make you feel guilty, but it's actually to encourage you just to keep growing in how you're giving. So there's four levels of giving. In fact, there's before the first level, it's what I would call the pre-giving level. It's where I'm not giving. But the first level is what we call the basic level. This is where I, I get on the steps. I, I give my first gift to God. And this is a good place to start. But again, this is, not a, this is a place you don't want to, you want to stay. But this is the beginning of you and I honoring God with our finances. It's a good starting point. Sometimes we find ourselves there when we're just maybe sporadically giving, when we, we give, when we remember, or when we feel like it, or when the pastor talks about it, you know, different things like that, uh, that we can find ourselves on that level. So let me just pause. This might be a good place for me to pause and, and ask this question. Why should we even give our money to God? Is this really that big of a deal? Well, truth is, giving of our finances is not going to earn our ticket into heaven, right? So I don't have to give a dime and I can still go to heaven. So that's where some people are like, hey, it doesn't really matter. I'm just, I believe in Jesus, give my life to Jesus. I just follow him, okay? And, and so we're thankful that our ticket to heaven is built upon his grace and not our works and what we do and even how much we give, right? Amen. And wouldn't it be a bummer if you get to the end and Jesus was like, you were a dollar short, you did not make it. Go to hell forever. You should have given that one dollar. I told you, I was speaking to you. <laughs> you know? Okay, so it's not about how much we give, <laughs> thankfully. There's not a certain level uh, of that. <laughs> uh, we, we, we have a relationship with God, and we get to heaven all based upon his grace. Okay, so, but if we're going to really follow Jesus, then we've got to commit to his teachings, right? I want to live a Christ-centered life, and that's centering my life on him and his teachings, and so he talks a lot about money. We've looked at Matthew 6 quite a few times. We'll look at it again, where this kind of expounds on the treasure principle, but, but Jesus says, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and with thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in, in where? In heaven. That's a real place, did you know? It's a real place. Store up for yourself Treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And man, I want my heart to be on Jesus. And so I want to make him my treasure and I want to make sure that I live a, a life centered around him. And so that includes how I manage and handle these this finances and this, this money that he's given to me. And so the good news about Jesus is he's not anti-treasure. He's actually pro-treasure. He wants you to have treasure. He says, just make sure you're investing in the right place. Because if you invest in treasure on earth, then, hey, you'll experience maybe some good stuff, maybe a lot better than, than other people, but it's going to end. Make sure you invest in the place that's going to last forever. In heaven. That home 
that you want to be in for all of eternity. So Jesus is not looking for us just to be poor hermits, to be poor people who just barely make it through life financially. That's not what he's saying there. He's wanting to make sure that we are being wise in how we invest our money. We want to invest in the kingdom. We want to invest with an e eternal perspective. And so really he's saying there's only one safe place to invest our money. Invest it in his kingdom. You can invest it in the stock market. You can invest in mutual funds. But the return on that is going to pale in comparison to the return that Jesus gives you in heaven. So, Jesus is saying, invest in the kingdom of heaven. I love what Martin Luther says. This is a good quote from him. He says, I've held many things in my hands and lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. Second level, number two. This is what we would call the regular level. This is those who give systematically. They give on a regular basis. So we're talking about frequency here, okay? Regularly. It's frequency. But also, I'd say this refers to what most Americans would say. This is, you know, the regular way to give as well. But let me encourage you to give in these two ways. One, in a way that provides accountability. And two, in a way that is identifiable. I think it's important that you and I give in a way that provides accountability. Hey, we all need accountability. In fact, I was listening to some guy this week talk about, you know, when you're, you know, some guys have accountability friends and partners and they help each other out, they encourage each other, they ask each other hard questions. And he says, I think one of the questions is, are you giving to God? How are you doing with your giving? He says, that's a part of discipleship and we need to ask each other that and help hold each other accountable to that. And I would agree. And we also want to do it in an identifiable way. And that means it's in a way that someone else knows that you gave. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 16. Look at it, just a few verses in 1 Corinthians 16. Paul says this in his first letter to the church in Corinth, verse 1, he says, Now, about the collection for God's people, okay, about the offering, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. So interesting few verses there. Paul is encouraging the Christians there, the followers of Jesus, hey, set aside a sum of money that's proportionate to your income. So you're intentional, proportionally based upon your income. Now, the Bible never says a, a, an exact dollar amount, you need to give this. And, you know, some people would say, that'd be so much easier if God just told me this is how much you need to give. If you, if you give $100 a month, then you're good in God's book. That'd be nice, but it's not about the amount. It's really about you and I giving sacrificially. That's really what it's about. It's about, you know, having this life where I live to give. I'm, I'm generous. So it's not about how much. It's just really about our heart. And it's, it's really about this, this, this sacrifice. And as I give, what I'm doing is I'm honoring God with my money. Remember, honor God with your wealth is what Proverbs 3 said. Because how we're honoring God is with, with giving is basically we're saying, God, I, man, I trust you with everything in my life, including this part of my life. Man, I'm so thankful for you, God. I'm thankful for this life you've given me. I'm thankful for my health. Thankful for my job. Thankful for this brain that you've given me that helps me make money. I'm just thankful for everything, God. And so, man, I want to make sure that I'm, I, I'm handling my money the way you want me to do this. So, again, Paul says, Set aside money in proportion to your income. And, he, and then he says, he gives them a frequency. This is how often you should do it. He says, do it on the first day of the week. Now, in those days, they got paid on the last day of the week. Everyone received their wage the last day of the week. And so then the next day, the first day of the week, they would set aside. Paul is saying, set aside that portion, determine that, and then bring it to, to the temple, which would be, you know, for us to bring it to the, to the church. And so they had a regular pattern of giving. And Paul was encouraging this. And I would encourage you to do the same. Now, I mentioned we want to do it in a way that's identifiable. So for our purposes, what that means is when you use that giving envelope that's in that, those seat backs in front of you, that's a way that you can give identifiably. Uh, also, when you give online, it's, it's identifiable. So it's good for us to give in a way that brings accountability to our life, and it's identifiable. And this is tough for us in our culture because we have this mindset of this is my money and this is my business, and you have no idea knowing what I do with my money. Yeah. And God would say... Um, I, I, yes, I do. And it's okay. We need to think differently about this. We need to have accountability. It's not that we need to put on the billboard what we give and all that, but it's, it's, 
it really ultimately still is between you and God, but it's also good to do it in a way that brings accountability and it's identifiable so that people know, hey, yeah, I, I, I'm giving. I trust God with my finances. Okay, so that's level two. That's the regular level. You doing all right? Okay, level number three. Here we go. This is what we would call the obedience level. This is when I return, keyword, return the full tithe to God. I return because it really, it's, it's his anyway, right? So the first two levels, the basic level, regular level, those are good places to start, but those are places you don't want to, to land. You don't want to be there forever. This is, you want to really get to this third level, the obedience level, because this is where you're being fully obedient to God with your finances, which if you look at it this way, that brings a whole other set of questions, right? So if I'm being fully obedient now, finally, then was I being partially obedient before? And technically, that would be the case, right? And partial obedience is disobedience. So this is where I'm stepping to that place where I'm being fully obedient with how God has called me to handle his money. Make sense? I mean, think about it this way. What if I went to my wife and I said, hey, Amy, I was faithful to you for 45 weeks out of 52 last year. Hey, that's pretty good though, right? That's, that's a good percentage. I mean, do the math percentage-wise. That's like a great batting average. You should feel really good about that. That's super high, probably in comparison to most. So we're good, right? And she'd be like, No. We're not good, okay? And, and in, even in first service, when I give this type of illustration, she can't even be quiet. She starts talking about, you know, she's got to respond. She's like, no, I don't like that illustration. Because even partial unfaithfulness is unfaithfulness, right? She wouldn't be good with that. And so even partial disobedience. <laughs> Thank you for making that clear. <laughs> even partial disobedience is still disobedience, right? So this obedience level is really about the tithe. It's the 10%. It's giving the tenth, returning that back to God. And so this is important, uh, important information for you to study and to understand. I'd encourage you to dive into this topic. Study this for yourself. There's so much in Scripture throughout Old and New Testament that you can dive into in regards to money and how we can handle our money in, in regards to the tithe. We've already looked at a couple of Scriptures on the tithe. Let me look at just one more. Just briefly look at one more. Malachi chapter 3 is where we're going to go. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 says this. I, the Lord, do not change. That's how it starts. And by the way, aren't you glad that God doesn't change? <laughs> Man, in a world that's constantly changing, in a world where you're changing constantly, did you feel that when you looked in the mirror this morning? Man, I'm changing. It's for the good, though, just so you know. You're looking way better, okay? It's for the good. But in a world that's changing and everything around us is changing, it's good to know that God doesn't. Amen. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you. And I love that. God will always respond. When we respond to him, he will always respond back to us. It says the Lord Almighty, but you asked, how are we to return? Will a man rob God? God asked them, really, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? So God says in tithes and offerings. In both, interestingly enough. In tithes and offerings, which would be above and beyond that tithe. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. See, it's the great thing about God is that, just like we sang, He is good, and He will never let us down. And he wants to pour out blessing onto our life. Yeah. Now, here's the deal. He loves you, and his grace is there for you no matter what. Amen. It's not even dependent upon how much you and I give. But we also got to understand there's some principles that apply to our life. Like the principle of, like, we reap what we sow. That happens. Okay, and so, and God is saying, hey, if you, if you test me in this, and then trust me in this, and step out in this, then you're going to see new blessings, greater blessings in your life than even what you experience already, even through my grace. God wants to bless you. 
Technically, the tithe isn't really about giving. It's simply just returning <laughs> what belongs to God. So how do American Christians do with this? Well, the truth is we struggle, guys. Even though a lot of people would agree with it, we still struggle with it. In fact, the stats show the average Christian gives about 2% of their income to the work of God. So what percentage of Christians do tithe? Well, it's said that about 3% of Christians tithe, that they obey God's principle on giving him their first 10%, that 10th. Now remember, that, guys, that's just the baseline. That's the, that's the obedience level. That's the starting level. And remember this. Hey, Jesus wants it all. It all belongs to him. Man, my family, my cars, all of my stuff, my job, my future, my hopes, my dreams, my desires, it all belongs to God, even my finances. And so tithing, as I'm giving that back to God, it just builds my faith for me to continue to say, God, it's yours. It's all yours anyway. Here you go. I trust you. Take it all. Take it all. Okay, the big idea Remember, God owns everything. I'm his money manager. I remember when I first heard this principle, I was back in high school, and I worked this really pseudo part-time job. It was, you can't even call it part-time. I worked three hours every Saturday morning throughout high school. I made five bucks an hour working three hours every Saturday morning, so I got about 15 bucks a week. Do the math. I was rolling in the cash about $60 a month. Man, life was good. <laughs> 60, that's all I needed, though, to put gas in my Toyota Corolla and to buy all the Christian rap CDs that came out. And that's all I needed for, with that 60 bucks. And I was good. I even had money left over to go out to McDonald's, which is right next to my church. And that was good, too. And so I remember hearing my pastor talk about the tithe, and I'm like, man, I need to, I need to do that. I really want to live a life fully surrendered to God, and I'm going to trust him with this. And, and so I started even then, which doesn't seem like much when you're given, you know, like six bucks a month. But for me, I'm like, hey, that's a couple Happy Meals or whatever, you know. And Okay, you know, but it's just, it was for me, it was the beginning of like, God, I'm going to trust you with this. And, and it began something in my life where I saw that I can trust God with all this money. And, and thankfully, I make more than that now. But through the years... Uh, it's been something I've continued to exercise, and I've seen that God always takes care of me. He always takes care of my family. In fact, I've, just, I've seen so many blessings. I've seen, so, I've seen God come through in miraculous ways. And it all comes back to I fully trust him in this area of, of doing the tithe. So long before I was ever a pastor even teaching and preaching on this, I was experiencing God's blessings. I really want you to experience God's blessings in this. Trust him in this. And he even again says, test me in this. That's why we're issuing this 90-day tithe challenge. If you've never gotten to that step, that third level of the obedience level, test God in this. For the next 90 days, tithe. And see what God does in your life. Okay? God owns everything. I'm just his money manager, right? So the last level, as we bring it home, is this. This is the generous level. Okay? This is where I get to this level of a generosity. This is where I'm getting beyond the tithe into offerings, just living a generous life. Uh, I'm giving 11, 12, 15, 20% of my income away. And man, when you get to this place, you are breaking materialism and consumerism off of your life. And what happens when you get to this place? You begin to discover the full joy of giving. And this feels good. I love it. I'm able to give. I'm able to help. I'm investing into, into God's kingdom trusting God, and he's still taking care of me and blessing me in ways that I could have never, ever dreamed. I've heard of people say, man, I, I started trusting God with this area of my life, and I didn't get back more money, but you know what I got? My child came to know Jesus.
card information on that dropped in the black box. Those black boxes by the doors. Hang it up. Those are secure. We'll pick those up after the service. church would you do something awesome it was kind of like one of those seeds i was sowing a seed and remember you and i we reap what we sow second corinthians 9 remember whoever sows sparingly also reaps sparingly but whoever sows generously will reap generously hmm. i want you to reap generously and that's all determined upon how we sow so we just want to keep sowing the right way so generously, and you will reap generously. That's a spiritual principle that's all over God's word that, that works. It just happens. You and I will reap what we sow. So make sure you're generous in that. And make sure you don't forget this. Hey, in the end, God owns everything. I'm just his manager, right? So let me ask you a question as we bring it to a close here. Think about this. When you leave this world, when I leave this world, what will I be known for? When well, people think about me as someone who accumulated treasure on earth that I couldn't keep, or are people going to think about me and remember me as someone who invested treasures in heaven that I couldn't lose? What will I be known for? What will people think about me? In fact, even as I say that, maybe the better question is really what, what how am I going to really help myself? Because when you're on the other side of, of this life and you're into eternity, it isn't really going to matter what other people think about you. It's all only going to matter how you and I live part of how we lived is how we gave. Live to give. So here's the next steps that we're, we're at, issuing every week. These three challenges. The first one is take the 90 day tithe challenge. This is the way you can respond to this type of message. Test God for 90 days and see what he does. The second one is to commit to the My Giving Covenant. You got one of these in your program today. So you can look at that again even right now if you'd like. Many of you have, have looked at this, read this over. Many of you have signed it perhaps, but I would, I don't, I'm not going to talk about it because I want you to take it home, read through it, study it, study the scriptures, pray through this. And this is you and I looking at money the way God looks at our money. And so this is a covenant of, of giving. Regardless of where you and I land on the whole tithe thing, does it really matter? The, the, the point is that Jesus is calling us to be generous. Just be super generous. And so this helps me view my money differently in light of eternity. So commit to that. The third one is pray about giving to Pastor Christian, the Youth Alive missionary just talked about that, but again, if you want to give, uh, there's still time to do that, and we'll send off another check to him this week. But I pray that you would grow in generosity. Would you stand your feet? We're going to take some time. We're going to pray through this, think about this. The worship team's going to come. They're going to lead us in that song that we sang earlier, talking about Jesus being the king of our heart, and this is really what it's all about, right? Is he really my king or is he not? Is Jesus really my Lord? Am I living a centered, a Christ-centered life? Or is he only Lord of certain areas of my life? Hey, these seven areas, God, you are my Lord. But I'm the Lord of these three. And though we may not ever say that, sometimes that's how we live. And so we really want to make sure that Jesus is the king of our hearts. So we're going to sing this song again. And like I mentioned earlier, Man, we'd love to pray with you. Whatever the need is, whatever the situation is, we got some prayer team people that would love to pray with you. They've been waiting to pray with you. And so we just want to be a church that responds to God, that looks to God, that calls upon him because he answers. And so feel free to come down and find one of these prayer team people and pray with them. You want to seek God, even come down on your own. Just come down to this front and you can seek God, you can pray. But as the team leads us in the song, the communion tables will be open, as they always are, two in the front, one in the back there by the cross. Take some time, any time during the song, and go to the communion table and thank Jesus for what he did for you on the cross. In fact, as we talk about making Jesus the king of our heart, maybe you've never done that ever before, and today's a day you can do that for the first time. 
Today's a day where you could surrender your life to him. I want to give you an opportunity to do that and make the greatest decision you could ever make in your whole life. Why don't you uh, close your eyes right now? We're going to pray. And I'm just going to ask some of you to respond. Maybe it's the day where you can respond to Jesus and say, it's time. It's time for me to surrender and fully trust Jesus with my life. To receive his grace and his forgiveness. To know that my eternity is secure. And to trust him now and forever. Maybe that's you. I'll give you an opportunity to respond to that. So close your eyes right now. Let's look to him and let's pray. Lord, first of all, Lord, I pray that all of us would be givers and be generous with our life, with our time, with our talents, and with our treasures. May we be generous people. May we be a generous church, I pray. Holy Spirit, help us to live this thing out to the best of our ability. Lord, for those that are here that need to surrender to you, Lord, I pray that, that you would reveal yourself to them, that you would show them you love them right now. It's your presence. Just the reality of, the, of your presence touch them even right now, I pray. Right now. With your eyes closed, I want to give you a chance to respond to that. Maybe you're here this morning and say, Tyron, I need to surrender my life to Jesus and follow him. I'll count to three. I'd love for you to slip your hand up when I get to three. But also, maybe you're here and you need to re rededicate your life. You've wandered away. It's time for you to come back. Return to God. And he says, I will return to you. I'll, I'll respond to you. So I'll count to three, and if that's you, just slip up your hand. We're going to pray a prayer of committing our life to Jesus and asking for his forgiveness. So one, maybe for the first time you're going to surrender him. Two, maybe you're coming back to him, rededicating your life. Three, anybody here that say, that's me? Thank you so much. Anybody else? Say, that's me, Tyrone. Today's my day. Receiving his forgiveness and his freedom, I'm going to live for Jesus. Anybody else? Say, that's me, Tyrone. I'm coming back, or I'm going to, for the first time, commit my life to him. So hey, would you join me in this prayer? Everyone, thank you, man, thanks. If you raise your hand, if you wanna mean this, this prayer from your heart, so that I would encourage you to repeat these words after me, and I'm gonna give you some words, but man, they gotta come from your mouth. You gotta believe them in your heart, you gotta confess with your lips these words, and pray this prayer, and God's gonna be gonna do something new in your life. So everyone repeat this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your love and your patience with my life. Right now I realize that I've sinned and I need your grace. So forgive me of all my sins. I wanna follow you. I wanna surrender my life to you and center my life around you for the rest of my life. Holy Spirit, fill me and strengthen me to live for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, can we give a hand to those that just prayed that prayer right now?